The optimal treatment selection assumption is that individuals always receive the treatment that is best for them, that's optimal for them. We write this mathematically as follows. So if you're in the treatment group, that means that your potential outcome under treatment is better than your potential outcome under no treatment. And similarly, if you're in the no treatment group, t equals zero, then your potential outcome under t equals zero is better than your potential outcome under t equals one. For example, you could have this assumption satisfied if you have some expert doctor prescribing treatment. So everyone that goes into that doctor, the doctor prescribes them the best option. So how can the OTS assumption help us with achieving bounds? Well, it tells us that the expected potential outcome Y1 in the control group is less than or equal to the potential outcome Y0 in the control group. Right, that just follows from this line right here. And then the potential outcome y0 in the control group is just equal to expected value of y given t equals 0 by the consistency assumption. We'll just collapse that here. And this inequality is what we'll be using to get an upper bound with the OTS assumption. To get a lower bound, we'll consider the following. This says that the potential outcome y0 given that t equals 1 is less than or equal to the potential outcome y1 given t equals 1. And that just follows from right here. So t equals 1, potential outcome y1 is greater than or equal to y0. And then we just use consistency again. And we'll just collapse this. These two inequalities are what we'll use to get an upper and lower bound with the OTS assumption. First, we'll see the upper bound. Here is what we saw on the previous slide just now. As usual, to get this upper bound, we start with the observational counterfactual decomposition. And we see that this counterfactual quantity here is exactly what we have here, which is upper bounded by this. So just plugging that in, we have this. And then we plug in A here, just like we did in the no assumptions bound. If it's not clear where we plug in A there, then go ahead and take a second to think about that and convince yourself. And now we see that this second and fourth term cancel, which gives us the following. This is an upper bound that we get from the OTS assumption. Similarly, we can get a lower bound. This is the other inequality that we saw two slides ago. And if we just multiply both sides by negative one, we flip the inequality. So now we see that we have a lower bound on this term, which is exactly what we have here with the negative sign. Plugging that in, we get the following. And we also lower bounded this counterfactual with A, just like we did in the no assumptions lower bound. Then we see that the first and third term cancel. So we're left with just the following for our OTS lower bound. Great, so let's put that all together to see the complete bound and corresponding interval length. So here is the upper bound from two slides ago and the lower bound from last slide. And then if we subtract those two, subtract upper round minus lower bound, then we get this corresponding interval length. And we'll now plug in the numbers from the running example to this bound. Recall what the no assumptions bound gives us. Then if we plug in these numbers to this OTS bound, we get this interval. The ATE must be between minus 0.14 and 0.27. This gives us an interval length of just 0.41. This is much smaller than the interval length of 1 that the no assumptions bound gives us. By moving from the initial trivial interval to the no assumptions interval, we cut the interval length of 2 in half to 1. And here, by making the OTS assumption, we've cut the interval in more than half again, from a length of 1 to 0.41. However, even though we've cut the interval length all the way down to 0.41, we still haven't identified the sign of the causal effect. In other words, this interval still contains 0. And we'll now finally move to a bound that identifies the sign. In other words, we'll be able to distinguish some causal effect from a causal effect of 0. This bound also stems from the OTS assumption, so we'll call this OTS bound 2. So here's the OTS assumption again, and the inequality that 
we use that's implied by this assumption in the OTS bound 1 is this. The expected value of y1 given t equals 0 is less than or equal to the expected value of y given t equals 0. For the OTS bound 2, we will use this implication of the OTS assumption. The expected value of y1 given t equals 0 is less than or equal to expected value of y given t equals 1. We'll now show why this follows from the OTS assumption. First, we have this equality, where we've swapped out the conditioning on t equals 0 for conditioning on this inequality here. And this follows from this part of the OTS assumption. Then, because we're taking the expected value of y1, if we were to flip this inequality here, now that before y0 was greater than y1, now y1, the thing that we're taking the expected value of, is greater than y0. So y1 has become bigger than what we're conditioning on here. Now we get this upper bound on the above. And this event that we're conditioning on here is actually implying that we're conditioning on t equals 1. This follows from the same part of the OTS assumption. So all we do is we take the contrapositive. So the contrapositive here is that A implies B is the same as saying not B implies not A. So that's just how contrapositive logic works. And then not B is what we had here, and then not A is what we turned it into. So that's where we have that equality. Then finally, we just use consistency as usual. And that completes our proof of this inequality that we'll be using for the OTS bound 2. Note that we only used this second part of the OTS assumption here. We're going to prove the upper bound, and then I'll ask you to prove the lower bound, which will require you to use this part of the assumption using similar proof that we used here. Okay, so let's now prove the OTS upper bound 2. Here's what we have from the last slide, that the OTS assumption tells us this inequality. And as usual, we'll start with the observational counterfactual decomposition. Now, in this OTS upper bound 2, instead of upper bounding this term with the expected value of y given t equals 0, like we did in the upper bound 1, we're going to upper bound it with the expected value of y given t equals 1. And that's what we get here where we have used a here again in place of this counterfactual for the upper bound for this counterfactual. Then this simplifies as follows. And that's the OTS upper bound too. For the next question, I'll ask you to prove a corresponding new lower bound using the version of the OTS assumption that we used in the last slide. So that's what I was mentioning. You will take the other part of the OTS assumption, and do a proof like two slides ago where we use the contrapositive logic to get that other inequality. And you'll actually see this lower bound without proof on the next slide. So go ahead and pause now if you want to try out that OTS lower bound 2 proof. Here is the OTS upper bound that we just showed and the corresponding lower bound that you can go ahead and prove. And here is the interval length that we get if we subtract the lower bound from the upper bound. And we're going to plug our running example into this bound. Here are the numbers for that again. And recall what we got from the no assumptions bound, that the AT is between minus 0.17 and 0.83. Then if we make the OTS assumption, this bound tells us that the AT is between 0.07 and 0.76. So here we've actually identified the sign of the effect. Under the OTS assumption, we know that the AT is positive. We'll now do a bit of comparing and mixing of the two different OTS bounds, so they each have an upper bound and a lower bound. Here are the numbers from our running example. Here's the no assumptions bound when we plug those numbers into that. And here is the OTS bound 1 when we plug those numbers into that. So we saw this a bit ago. And here is the OTS bound 2 that we just saw on the last slide. The OTS bound 2 was great because we identified the sign of the effect, but 
it gives a 68% larger interval. 0.69 is the interval length, which is 68% larger than 0.41, the OTS bound 1. So while the OTS bound 2 identifies the sign of the effect, it tells us whether or not their causal effect is non-zero, the interval is much larger than what we got in the OTS bound 1, where the interval did contain zero. Well, both these bounds follow from the same assumption, the optimal treatment selection assumption. So we actually can just take the better lower bound from the OTS bound 2 and the better upper bound from the OTS bound 1. And that gives us this. Here, the interval length is only 0.2. So by making the OTS assumption, we've managed to identify the sign of the effect. We know it's positive, And we've managed to get a pretty small interval length of 0.2. And we also could have used the OTS upper bound 2 and combined that with the OTS lower bound 1. That would have given us an interval that ranges from negative 0.14 to 0.76, so a really bad interval. But that's just because of the specific example that we're looking at with these numbers. Under different examples, different combinations of these upper and lower bounds will be better. So all of the applications that we've seen with this running example are all specific to the specific numbers in this running example. Different bounds will do better than others in different scenarios. This marks the end of the bound section. Hopefully you've seen in this section that you can get a bit creative with the different assumptions you make to get different bounds. And even with just one assumption, say the optimal treatment selection assumption, as we just saw, you could imagine that there's different bounds that follow from just that one assumption. So there really is a lot of room to play around with different bounds. It's usually going to be pretty constrained by your specific problem setting. So there's going to be certain assumptions that don't make any sense in your problem setting and other ones that make lots of sense or are kind of between the two. It's a bit unclear whether it makes sense to make that assumption, right? And that's the law of decreasing credibility. Depending on how strong your assumptions are, you'll have different amounts of credibility. So stronger assumptions will give you smaller intervals, you know, more precision, but they'll also make your conclusions less credible because the assumptions were strong. So hopefully what we've done in this bound section is show you how you might be able to make assumptions that are pretty okay in your problem setting. And that with those credible assumptions, you can get meaningful intervals that the ATE must fall in under those assumptions. If you're interested in learning more about these and how they've been applied in practice, then go ahead and check the papers from Charles Mansky that I linked to in the bounds portion of the course book.